Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plan clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service here in Hernando County. And with me today are my regular co-hosts, Colby Pitts, who is the Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, and Bernie, who is one of our Master Gardener volunteers and answers a lot of questions here at the office. So um, good morning to everybody. Remember, we're here to answer your questions. So if you have a question, just go ahead and put it in the comments. However, you're watching us, because right now we are on Facebook page, uh, Facebook group, and two different YouTube channels. So we're all over the internet right now. So however you're watching us, just go ahead and put in the comments and we should be able to see that. Let me, there we go. I got that on. So guys, we were just talking about how busy it is this time of year. Cause I think mm -hmm. cause spring is around the corner. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I, I tend to, I, it's, it's also the end of the month, which for me is always, uh, I always have a lot going on right at the end of the month, but on top of, you know, we got Earth Day coming up. Um, yeah. And I, of course I have a rain barrel workshop tomorrow. I have to take my cats to the vet today, which means I'm working a short day. So I'm like trying to cram everything in. Uh, yes, I'll be there tomorrow morning. I'll be there a little bit before 10. Wonderful. It's a big one. A lot of people signed up. How many people for compost bins? Uh, 20 plus. Wow, that's signed great. Up. Anyways, yeah, uh, I think the, you know, the Facebook ads really, really did it, is, mm -hmm. is my hypothesis anyway. So that's a little a little tip for everybody watching us. Follow us all on Facebook, and that way you're going to find be one of the first ones to find out about our upcoming events. You can keep on top of things. We do things in person. We do things online. We do things in person and online. We do things live online, like what we're doing right now. And then this gets recorded so that people could watch it later. So if you have to go halfway through, you can always come back and watch the second half at your convenience. Mm -hmm. That's that's everything. I, if I ever do a like a live class, it always I always record it, and it is always on the uh, FFL playlist on the Hernando County Government YouTube. Uh, normally yeah, with the I new do weekend. my best. And even when I do um, online classes that require registration, I record it, and eventually I take that recording, send it to John Cancel with Hernando County Government. He cleans up the video and puts it on Hernando County Government's YouTube channel. So... So all these things are either immediately available or in the process of being tweaked and finished and post-production before they go up. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any comments. So you got you guys yeah. need to. Yeah, no, we, we got. Wait, Bernie. I think they all need some coffee. And what should they do with their coffee grounds when they're done making coffee? You know, that, that's one of those things that, that almost qualifies as an old wives' tale. Uh, coffee grounds do have uh, some benefits. They, they tend to lower the pH of the soil, and they are a high nitrogen source. On the other hand, caffeine uh, is allelopathic, which means that it puts the big hurt on, on plants. So uh, coffee bushes... Uh, tend to produce caffeine, uh, not so much so people drink it and stay awake, but it, the, the caffeine keeps all the other plants away from it. And in fact, in the uh, coffee plantations, uh, the uh, caffeine will build up and and start uh, stunning the growth of the caffeine of, of the coffee plant. So uh, the the caffeine is a problem if, if you have uh, a a real rich high organic content soil and you're using uh, coffee grounds as, as a mulch, uh, you probably would have caffeine problems and and, and uh, it would stunt the growth. It, it would also, though, uh, keep a lot of plants, a lot of weeds from popping up. Uh, in our sandy soils, uh, the caffeine probably uh, uh, 
percolates out pretty quick. I, I would say that the, the life of the caffeine here is, is probably less than a couple of years. So um, this, this all started, uh, some of the um, coffee shops uh, have, have taken to putting barrels of coffee grounds and a big sign, free mulch. So, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't really a problem when all you had was what came out of your own uh, percolator coffee pot. But uh, now that you can go get a bucket full, uh, you might want to be careful. It, uh, coffee grounds, uh, it's one of those things, uh, in most instances, the, the truth is probably not all that great. Uh, in, in the sandy soils, probably doesn't make much difference. So, uh, but some yeah. Think, uh, and I know it's a good ingredient for compost, but we always, encourage people to put a wide mixture of ingredients in your compost pile. You want to include lots of diversity. You don't want to make one huge pile of all coffee grounds or all sawdust or all shredded paper because all those things compost, it's just when you have 100% of one ingredient, it may take a very long time. I've never seen a compost bin, a full compost bin's worth of coffee grounds. That's a lot of coffee grounds. You know, you, you wonder, do, do the uh, little microbes uh, get all hyper from the, the caffeine just like people? If they do, maybe that uh, you throw some coffee mm -hmm. grounds in and, and those little guys just work 24 hours a day uh, hyper and, and might might be beneficial. So you never and know. They they faster. You Unintended know. consequences. <laughs> you know, the, the program we did last week, we had a lot of audience participation. It was really great. So if you guys have any questions at all out there, we really like that. We we enjoy it. And, uh, and I'm sure that everybody enjoys hearing what other people think about. So here we go. <laughs> And we always enjoy hearing from Lily in the morning. Good morning, Lily. Uh, you must be freezing where you're staying. I know the last couple mornings have been absolutely freezing for me when I walk out the front door. Uh, but Lily says, there's lots of Chickasaw plums and red buds blooming in Sumter County. Somebody told me just yesterday, I think she's in Hernando County, but very, very close to Citrus. And she said they're red buds we're blooming also and it seemed early. So it's that time of year. Um, Hernando used to be the Southern edge for red buds. Now I guess Sumter is, we still have a few here in Hernando County. We really are on the edge of where red bud trees are gonna do well. North of here, they do great. You go to Gainesville, red buds, red buds grow great up there. You go south of here and you really don't see them because they tend to die from different various diseases and problems during the summer. So, yeah, the, oh, the, okay, here everybody woke up. <laughs> the, those wild plums really are doing great. You know, if you, if you see the uh, white small trees really in bloom uh, on the edge of, of forested areas, uh, that's generally these, these plum trees around here and, and they are really pretty. Yes, and if you if you're um, the kind of person that goes hiking in the woods, you'll see uh, the native plums and a few other trees that are all flowering now out in the woods. So you're walking down the path through the woods and you see this tree that's just covered with little white flowers. It's that time of year. Spring is here. It did not feel like it this morning, but it's just around the corner, I think. Corey says coffee is good for killing or running off slugs and snails. It might make them move faster. It may help to deter them. I don't think it's specifically toxic for snails and slugs. Snails and slugs can be a tough one to handle. There's very few um, chemical controls out there if that's what you're looking for. Um, old, good old fashioned hand picking and physically Picking them up is very, very effective. Be sure to wear gloves though. Snails and slugs can be nasty. They can carry diseases. They can carry parasites. Don't be picking them up with your bare hands and don't eat raw ones. 
Hopefully, I didn't have to remind anybody of that. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> like, don't eat them. To, uh, to cover my bases, don't eat them raw, okay? Yeah, the, the escargot you get at the French restaurant is a different kind of snail. Do not eat your garden snails, please. Just like mushrooms. Grocery store mushrooms are safe. Mushrooms that you've run across out in the forest, maybe not so much. Oh, Bernie's got a snail there. Yeah, can you recognize that? Is that a rosy, what, rosy wolf? That's what snail, we think. Hard to see, a little blurry. Well, yeah, these, these guys eat other snails. Yeah. So, they're pretty. You know, the uh, the beer trap for slugs actually works. That's That's not too bad a thing. Yeah. And if you want to attract them to gather them, them up and humanely dispatch them, if you put a piece of cardboard or a board out in the yard during the day, they'll all go under the board for protection. And that's where they all are, most of them. So that's another little tip to monitor or make them all gather together to make it a little bit easier. Yes, here, at least in Hernando County, we have very, very few dogwood trees. There is a native dogwood, but you don't see it very often. And Hernando is, once again, right on the line about where they're going to grow. Further north of here, up around Gainesville and North Florida, you're going to see more dogwoods. You see very few here. There's some, but not a lot. Bernie, we have a question from a name that I don't recognize. Somebody brand new asking a question about a landscaper added bromeliads to pots on my patio. And that's great. Bromeliads can grow just great in containers. You can get decorative containers. You can make everything match color-wise and shape-wise. But it gets lots of sun, a lot of burn. Do these need more shade? Absolutely. There are very, very, very few bromeliads that will take full sun. I had one of them, and uh, it was out where the dogs could uh, lay on it. And uh, poor thing is, is taking a lot of abuse. But uh, <laughs> bromeliads are basically a, a, a shade-loving plant. And uh, uh, almost mostly shade, the full shade, for most bromeliads. Uh, and and if, if they act unhappy and they're in pots, definitely move them someplace where uh, they're not getting uh, at, at least afternoon sun. It really is damaging to most bromeliads. Yeah, Isn't a lot of it... bromeliads, if you have a large shade tree and you put it under the tree so that it's just getting that speckled sun during the day, they can do really well there. Um, bromeliads, so those, I, I remember reading somewhere that you can like almost kind of control what they look like uh, based off how much light you give them. So if, if, if they're in like a sh uh, uh, with less light, the, they end up growing like longer, like thinner when they're really green, um, their leaves get. And then if you put them in the sun, they end up like shorter and uh, shorter, more stout, uh, lighter colored leaves. I always thought that was interesting. I think it was it was bromeliads that do that. And so the other like thing is the, the bromeliads that, that take more sun tend to have brighter flowers. So mm -hmm. the, the ones that are in the shade uh, usually are, are a much more brilliant green. Uh, the, the foliage is, is the thing. Uh, the ones that are, are in more sunlight, uh, the flowers become really gorgeous. I'm, I'm amazed at how pretty they are. And there's exceptions. Um pineapples are bromeliads and they like full sun i remember my dad not not a gardener at all <laughs> man we tried to do pineapples so many times it, it, it you know most of the time it would get like knocked out of the ground or something before you ever got a chance to get a pineapple off of it but i remember one time we ended up with a pineapple about this big and it was terrible <laughs> So Monique was asking, where can you buy the native plum trees? Um, a native plant nursery. 
I know our Master Gardener Nursery, we have had them in the past. I don't believe we have any right now. Um, if you look online for a local Florida native plant nursery, you can contact them and find out if they carry them. So they are available, but you're not going to find them at the big box stores or the big um, um, garden centers or nurseries. Not a very commonly used landscape plant. They they tend to be an understory plant. So yeah, uh, as a as a single plant as a specimen, they don't do as well. But uh, if if you have an area where you've already got a, a few trees, um, so you can have a, a a mixed sun mixed shade area to plant them, then they really take off and do well here. Okay, looks like Corey looked up some research on that coffee also, as did Bernie this morning. Gosh, all these, I'm surrounded by caffeine experts now, although I do have my appropriate size coffee cup here for work. Um, so Oregon State University says that perhaps more exciting than the positive effect of coffee grounds is a compost and soil amendment because you can compost it. You just don't want to make it want your compost pile 100 percent of anything really you want to use a mixture of different things it's going to break down faster and better it says its potential is a slug killer research shows that using a one to two percent solution mixed with water as a soil drenched caused 100 percent of slugs to leave the treated soil and subsequently die of caffeine poisoning how much coffee do you have to drink to get caffeine poisoning i wonder I well, I don't even want to think about it. It's got to be a lot. <laughs> I've, I've never hit that point, thankfully. Um, so apparently, caffeine from coffee grounds can be used or tried as a um, snail or slug killer. So probably worth try. If anybody tries that, please, you know, let us know how well it works. And like I said, there's very, very few... Um, chemical options for uh, dealing with snails and slugs. They could be a tough one to um, deal with. Teresa, I see Teresa is on here now and putting up fact sheets. Okay, here's a different question for Bill, kind of a springtime question. He said he bought a tropical snow peach last week and it's blooming. It's a low chill, low chill hour peach variety. Yes, that is correct. That's a low chill peach. Should do very well in in Central Florida. I'm not sure exactly where you are, but that's appropriate for here, right, Bernie? What what happens to these if we get a late freeze? It it tends to knock the flowers and the teeny tiny fruit off of them. Late freezes are very bad. Whether you live in Florida. Um, Georgia, Georgia peaches, sometimes they'll have a really bad late freeze or frost, and then they have a smaller harvest, and peach prices are a lot more, a lot higher when they do come into market. So, yeah, a late freeze, very bad. Yeah, we, we had a uh, farm uh, just over the, the border uh, southeast of here that uh, when the orange trees got zapped, he replaced them with peaches and uh, lost everything twice from late frost so uh yeah i noticed when i went by the other day that all the peach trees are gone now so how fast does an orange tree grow if you start from seed it's seven to ten years to fruit so uh if you do a uh, grafted to a um Older rootstock, use a, a later uh, plant to graft a, a decent rootstock. Uh, you can get fruit in, in two to three years. Makes a big difference. Uh, the, the juvenile stage of orange trees uh, from seed uh, is fairly long. So uh, that, that's why one of the reasons why things are grafted. The other one is uh, you, you get some characteristics that you really need in Florida, one of which mm -hmm. is nematode resistance by choosing the right rootstock. But uh, if you want to grow your, or your orange tree from uh, a seed that you've gotten, uh, there's a, a 
good chance that you can do it. I mean, I, it's, it's one of those things that uh, you, you probably will be successful in getting a tree, but uh, you don't count on any fruit for 10 years. You may get it at seven. You may get it at five, but it's probably going to be in that uh, close to 10 years. So, uh, yeah, you'll have to be patient. And the, the ultimate size of the tree depends on the variety and on the rootstock both. So uh, both things affect the ultimate size. So uh, they, they tend to grow uh, very, very fast at, at the end of the juvenile stage. And then they tend to not grow very fast anymore after that. So uh, it, it, they're, they're nice trees from a, a farming standpoint in that uh, you get them all set up and, and uh, you don't have to do quite that much maintenance to the, the tree size. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we have a disease. So uh, if, if you plant one and, and you, you really love it, uh, you know, I, I I can appreciate that. I, I had a, a key lime, and I really thought that was the, the neatest tree. I, I babied it. I had it potted. Took it inside when it froze, all those things. And and you get limes year-round. They're, they're mm -hmm. a great tree, and, and you can hold them at about any size you want. You can, you know, put it at four feet, keep it pruned at four feet, keep it in a pot, do a little root pruning once in a while and repot it. And, and I went 15 years with that tree. And in one year, I uh, had back problems and couldn't lift the pot, couldn't move it, and it froze. And, and it really yeah. upset me. So uh, I don't laugh at people that, that get upset when they lose a plant anymore. I understand how that goes. It's almost like losing a pet after you put that much energy into it. So yeah. anyway, plant an orange tree, uh, see what happens, but realize that if it's outside, it's probably going to get the uh, citrus greening and it's going to die. So uh, it's, it's like getting any other pet. It's got a, a finite lifetime probably. Yeah. Okay. Lily pointed out that Monique has perfect area for one of those native plums, Chickasaw plums, under oaks in Brooksville. So it, it is an understory tree. It has no problems growing underneath bigger trees. If you are on a hike in the woods... They tend to be the short trees and the pines and oaks are the really tall ones and they still do just fine. Um, and Marie asked, do you recommend an everbearing strawberry? I was gifted a few and they died in the freeze zone 9A. I don't think everbearing strawberries as a general rule do well in Florida. No. I've heard of people that have them or they just use the University of Florida varieties of strawberries that the commercial growers use, the annual ones, and they try to keep them growing through the summer and keep them going for years and years like they did up north. does not work well in Florida. Summer is tough on us. It's really tough on strawberries. Um, I would think, I'm not even sure when they plant strawberries, let's say North Florida, Georgia, or further north than there. They grow them over the winter here in central Florida because they're able to deal with the freezes, but you're going to have a lot more freezes up in north Florida, southern Georgia. Um, they, this, uh, th this, are, this blog post from the St. John's County IFAS extension says mm -hmm. that they are planting them in October, November. That's when we plant them here in Florida. And they grow all winter long, but it gets a lot colder up north than it does here. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I've really so never, I've always we'll recommended to people grow them as an annual, you know, get the appropriate strawberries, not the kind that you grew up in Ohio, because they're not going to grow well here. Get the Florida varieties of strawberries here in central Florida, grow them over the winter, start, put them in the ground, October, and November. Probably going to get the first strawberries, hopefully, for Christmas. Um, March and April, you're going to get the biggest harvest. Then after that, pull them up, cut your losses. They're going to decline during the summer anyway. That's a good plant for towers here in our area. Yeah, yeah. a lot of you pick places use them. 
For anybody interested in growing peaches or nectarines, Teresa put a link to a fact sheet there and also one from University of Florida about growing citrus. I know UF is making a big push to encourage homeowners to start planting citrus because we have a greening resistant variety that's called Sugar Bell, Sugar B-E-L-L-E, and that is greening resistant. And for Anne Marie, that grows all the way up into the Panhandle and even Southern Georgia, I think. After it's been in the ground for a couple of years and has grown some, they're very, very cold tolerant. You know, when people ask about peaches, uh, if, if you're a homeowner and all you want to do is just get a crop, uh, I recommend you actually plant three trees. Plant a, a shorter chill hour than what our area is. Uh, the proper chill hour tree for our area and a, a couple hundred hour longer. One of the three trees will produce fruit. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the problem with peach trees is they have a very short life in Florida. They, they really don't like the summers. They age dramatically. A tree that goes 25 years in Georgia goes 10 or 12 years in Florida. Uh, and you need to thin the fruit. If you want large peaches, uh, you have to go through and, and take off uh, probably a little over half the fruit. So uh, you, you want uh, 10 to 12 inches between fruit for maximum size. And, and so it's not an, a, an easy carefree plant. Uh, if, if you, but they do well here. It's, it's kind of funny. They, they, for all the bad things about them, they, they produce really great fruit. So uh I, I think peaches are, are, are a great crop for a, a person that likes to garden. Uh, they're a miserable plant for somebody that, that doesn't want to spend any time doing anything. So. Yeah, they're not no maintenance, carefree. They take care of themselves. Not exactly. No, you, you have to prune them exactly to the right shape. So you end up with the open tree in it. Uh, and, and then you have to work with the, the fruit and it, it's a problem, but it really produces well. And if, if you're, you know, uh, the the grandmother that grows everything can grow fantastic peaches, and and they're really really good here. So, I I, I kind of recommend them, and I kind of don't. <laughs> okay, ASG pal, I'm really not sure if the nursery has chicks hall plums or not. I'm thinking that they probably don't. They have in the past, and they may have a few, but they probably don't have a lot. We need to start carrying them again. We have given them away for free at past uh, Arbor Day events. They're, they tend to be very popular. Even if you never, ever get any plums off of them that you can eat and do something with, because they tend to be really sour, but they're very good for canning you know, canning and jellies and jams. If you throw enough sugar in, you're going to fix it right up and they're going to be wonderful because sugar fi sugar fixes everything. Um, but it's, they're really great for wildlife. So don't have your heart broken if the little animals in your neighborhood end up with all the plums. You know, that's what's naturally supposed to happen. That's why they grow in the woods, to help feed little animals out in the woods. And yeah, they, they can be hard to find. Um, one nursery that I could recommend that is over in Groveland is called Green Isle. Green Isle. It's Green, Green Isle. Isle. Green Isle I Nursery. Did. And it's a native plant nursery. And I know that they carry Chickasaw plums. I'm not, I, I mean, I can't say for sure whether they're in stock today or not, but that's a very good place to look for native plants. And you're correct. Um, things like Chickasaw plums and a lot of other natives, you can't go to a, a big box store and find them. They don't carry them. And see Lily chimes in that Green Isle in Groveland probably has the native plum trees. I'm sure that they carry them, whether or not they have them in stock at the moment, I'm not sure. 
because with all the interest in native plants, native flowers, native trees, they are doing a bumper business out there. And I'm thrilled for them because they're very, very nice people to deal with. Yeah, they're they're pretty much a research center on on native plants. They're one of the people that have really found what will grow and, and what can be cultivated. And um, they, they've probably done more for native plants than just about any of the people in at least in our area on, on native plants. Mm -hmm. And other stores are starting to carry more and more natives. Um, over the years, the number of native plants that you can find at every nursery and big box store has increased because of demand. People are looking for it. So they're starting to carry more bit by bit. Uh, Anson's in Crystal River has natives because that's where Bill got his tropical peach tree. So yeah, the University of Florida has developed peaches, low chill peaches, low chill plums, which I had like three plum trees years ago. And when we had a really long cold winter, they would do great. They, we just, I just got bumper flowering, got a lot of fruit. And also low chilled nectarines. So they're all worth trying. Yeah, I I had plum trees on their own rootstock. And uh, they didn't like the nematode load that I've got. So uh, I, I have learned that there are a handful of, of things that uh, really are terribly attractive to nematodes. Uh, figs are, are one of them. Um, and the plums uh, are another one. And I, I haven't ever had any citrus on its own rootstock, but I, I understand it, that they are really a problem. So that, that's one of the things you want to make sure that, you know, if, if you get these things and you're planning on having them for a long time, Get them from a reputable nursery, somebody that, that's been around a while, not somebody that's just set up in a truck selling plants today and they'll be gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You have no idea if those plants are, are uh, really satisfactory for your area or not. Never spend a lot of money on a plant unless, one, you've done some investigation, and second, you buy it from somebody that is in the plant business in the community. And, and I push that. And uh, I push it and push it, and people still go out and, and they say, Oh, that's pretty. They drop 50 or 100 bucks on a plant, take it home, and watch it die. And man, I will watch enough plants die. That yeah. I've already done it for you. You don't need to do that anymore. You, <laughs> you can go out and, and get some good stuff and start. Have, have you noticed that we've been having frost on the windshields lately? Yes, I have first thing in the morning. I'm not happy about that. Well, I'm not happy that we're not having it on the ground. It, well, yeah. this is going to be a, a really, really bad weed season. And, and with all the weeds, it's going to be really high pollen season. So if you're one of those people that is bothered by pollen, be prepared for a really, really bad season. You know, normally... We get some frost that kills all the bad guys. They're laying on the ground. They turn black and everything's great. But we, to the best of my knowledge, we have not had a, a killing frost period this year. And, uh, you know, you, you need to get some pre-emergent down. Those, all those seeds that, that were produced uh, are going to turn into plants, which are going to make it even worse. So... If, if if you had any weeds at all in your lawn last year, be prepared to have tons of them this year, unless you go out and get some pre-emergent down. And and now is the time to do it. So just just a very important tip there that if, if you want to take care of, of your uh, lawn or or if you have a, a, a pasture area and and you're susceptible to uh, uh, the pollen problem. Get some pre-emergent down. Uh, I'm not supposed to mention any brands, but uh, Scott's has got a couple products, and uh, you know, Preen's the old standby. There's there's seven or eight different chemicals that, yeah. that work great as as pre-emergent. 
and any lawn center is going to have at least one of them and and you should be down out at your local station getting some and getting it on the ground now because you will have a problem it's going to be nasty just very important make sure you can use that product on whatever type of grass you have if you have a saint augustine lawn you need to make sure the label says that you can use it on saint augustine lawns if you have bahia grass make sure it can be used on bahia if you get that incorrect the product you're putting down may now kill your lawn or do damage to it or do something inappropriate to it along with killing the weeds so you have to be careful with that yeah have you ever noticed that some of these weed killers say safe for saint augustine lawns in big print right on the front of the bag and mm -hmm. when you read down at the, the bottom it says except floritam so uh that's that's one you got to really watch for because uh, floritam is the most common saint augustine we've got and, and a lot of these things that are safe on all the other floor uh, St. Augustine's are not safe on floor cam. So nothing like having your whole lawn disappear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't we don't want to see that happen. <laughs> Going back to the the fruit trees, um, would what would you guys say are some kind of less common some Maybe some stuff we typically don't see, you know, not not oranges or plums or peaches, but something way kind of out, out, like, you know, out of the box that you could grow here in the county. I know a lot of people like to grow mulberries, and they're tricky. They seem, it's, they seem to be one of those plants that either does really well or dies very quickly, and there's nothing you can do about that. Hmm. Now, mulberries tend to have a short life here. They, they, mm -hmm. we're to the south end of uh, where you can grow mulberries. the The big problem with them is that you want them away from the house. If you got a half acre lot and then you put a mulberry tree on it, you're probably going to have birds make a mess that uh, you're not going to like. So, uh, low pot is a good, good mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. and and then. Uh, Pendo palm is is another one. The the seeds of pendo palm are really really good. I like them, and uh, so I they, they they're similar to uh, loquats. Uh, you can make jelly out of them. Yeah, um, yeah. I know people make jelly out of the uh, pendo palm ones, and loquats. I saw a list once before. There's got to be like at least thirty different named varieties of loquats. So there's even different varieties of loquats. Some are bigger, smaller, taste this way, taste that way. So a lot of variety. It, it, it works out that you can pretty much have some kind of a fruiting tree year round. They, you know, loquats come in real early in the season. Uh, then uh, you, you take the, the, the citrus, you can have citrus for about five months. Uh, there, there's some of the citrus that comes in early in the fall, and and you can have citrus on through into uh, uh, January, February, and then the the loquats, and then what do we go to? Where what's the uh, the time on the Barbados cherries? During the summer, they start flowering some in the spring. And they're going to flower on and off all summer long, and you're going to keep getting fruit. So Barbados cherries is another option. They're a little bit tropical, but you can still grow them here. You probably want to grow them in a protected area. Uh, when they're young, keep them covered, you know, if we get a really bad freeze. But other than that, you can grow them. Anne Marie mentions bananas. You can grow bananas here. Some people have better luck. Some people not as much luck. But they they produce. You can get bananas. Bananas take eighteen months to two years to produce. So, yep. um, if if you have a freeze uh, after the first year, it wipes out the the crop. So you need uh, a year 
without a freeze, which we're having this year. People with bananas are going to do well. Mine have not frozen. They have not been damaged. I hope it stays that way. I mean, we're not done with the cold yet, but we're getting close. Um, if, if, if you want something really interesting on, on your uh, mulberries, pick a bunch of them, put them in a bowl, put some water in, and wait a couple of minutes. And then when you see what comes floating up to the top, you don't ever want to do that again. But, you know, you pick them, you eat them, that's not a problem. You pick them and, and you put some water on there, then you don't want to eat them anymore. Yeah, they're susceptible to all the little fruit flies and fruit fly larvae. It happens in certain fruits. Uh, got a question about somebody got no Barbados cherries last year. What is your secret? I don't really have a specific secret for Barbados cherries. It's all good management. So you need to keep an eye on them. If you start to have an insect pest problem, deal with it right away. They can get a variety of things. Um, uh, white flies, mealybugs, aphids, everything gets aphids. You can assume that everything in the world can get spider mites also. They can pop up on pretty much any plant. So you always need to be on the eye for those and deal with them quickly. And that way you keep a healthy plant going and should flower and fruit. And Teresa's just tossing all kinds of links to University of Florida fact sheets to kind of back up what we're talking about here. So go ahead and click on them. Make use of University of Florida resources. Um, and if you're watching this presentation recorded after the fact, feel free to shoot me an email if you have a question. Try to send a clear explanation of what the problem is. Pictures, lots and lots of pictures, no such thing as too many pictures. And I will get back with you as quickly as I can. I'm running about a day or two or three behind on emails right now because the stuff is just, certain days is just piling up. But we'll get back with you and help you figure out what your problem is. Uh, help identify whatever that insect pest is or disease, uh, what you can do to get your lawn growing, get your citrus tree growing, whatever the heck it is you're trying to grow, we'll help you out. Shoot me an email. Um, if you have any questions for Colby, well, here's his email. But, you know, y'all working for the county, you guys have really, really long emails, and I can never remember the the hernando.county.fl.gov. Well, that's dot, why dot, that's I why we use this that. one. We use the alias, the hernandocounty.us, because, yeah, my email has three dots in it, or, yeah, three dots in it at, at normal. So that's the one I give out. <laughs> or to make things simpler, he does have a link tree, so you can go there and find all of his different social media, website, all that information. Um, bum, 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 bum. If you'd like to learn more about a lot of these different topics, if you go to YouTube and look at the very top of your screen, that little box up there, little search box, search for Hernando County Government on YouTube, and they have a YouTube channel. If you go to it, it's broken up into playlists. I think the fire department has one. I'm sure sheriff's department has one and other departments have them. There's one for Florida friendly landscaping and there's one for extension. So if you go to those playlists, we have a lot of our classes recorded and on there for your viewing. You can watch them run across something you don't really understand. You have a question, then you can email us. But there's a lot of really good information we've piled up there over the years. As always, please follow us on Facebook. Uh, go ahead and like us, follow us. You know, we are just, and I'm not sure exactly how close we are today. We're just literally a few people shy of 10,000 followers. So we're almost there. And we will be doing something live on Facebook when we hit 10,000. I'm not sure what yet, but it's probably going to involve 
explosions, little pieces of paper or something. I'm, I'm going to have to figure that one out. So, so Bernie, don't start building explosives or anything yet. You know, we'll let you know if we need something. Oh, okay. You know, one other thing that I'd like to bring up while we're talking about the, the going online stuff, mm -hmm. is all you have to do on almost all these things is go to your, your search engine, Google, whatever, put in the subject and the letters UF, you know, pine trees, UF, uh, annual flowering plants, UF. You, as soon as you tack UF on a subject, if there's any uh, university publication on it, it comes right up. You, you uh, would be amazed that the university has hundreds, thousands of publications on every obscure thing that you can imagine. So mm -hmm. um, if, if, if you're going to spend any big money on buying a plant, take the name of that plant, tack UF on it, look it up and and really get a good education you know it, it it's kind of sad to plant something and plant it in the wrong place and and uh that happens so often people uh get a, a plant that, that shouldn't be in the sun and they put it in the sun we had the question earlier on bromeliads you know it, and and unless you you had a lot of experience or you're going on somebody else's experience that is so easy to do. I I, I moved to Florida, had never gardened, and uh, I, I did all these these things that people do when you come to Florida. I go to the big box store and I oh my God that's beautiful, and I took it home and, and I planted it and I watched it die and I uh, had a nursery not very far from us the the uh, uh, ark had a nursery and they didn't know anything about the plants, but they had some really beautiful plants. And I, I was buying plants, I don't know, three times a week and, and putting things in. And, and in desperation, I went to a class at the extension office and found out that, you know, that, that there's a place for things. And, and we started, if, if it didn't work, we, we dug it up and moved it someplace else, put it in a different type of environment. If it didn't like full sun, we put it in, in part shade. And if it didn't like part shade, we gave it full shade. And, and and we started moving things around. And that was the beginning of my being a gardener. I, I found that uh, if, if you put in a little effort, things grow. And, and I went from being the, the thumb of death for all these plants to... Uh, they only gasp a little bit, but they kept living. So uh, it, it's very important. And and the, the thing that, that drives so many people out of this is that it's very expensive to, to go buy exotic lawn plants. And anymore, it's even more expensive than it used to be. And, and it, it's so sad that so many people buy plants that are not going to work well. And, and when you start talking about palms, I, I'm amazed people spend thousands of dollars for palm trees and plant them here that shouldn't be here. I mean, they, they, we're, we're seeing uh, occasional palm trees that shouldn't have been planted north of Naples. And, uh, you know, and uh, uh, if you'd Googled that palm before you spent the money, you'd realize that that was a mistake. Uh, and the same thing, you know, if you got a $2,000 palm, you need to take care of it. Well, if it's in the middle of your lawn and you're using lawn fertilizer to, to do the, the whole lawn and the palm tree, eventually that palm tree is going to have problems. It does not like lawn fertilizer. Uh, the, the high nitrogen makes it grow and, and the no magnesium uh, and, and the short potassium that's in them just isn't enough. And so, you know, the, these, these problems uh, it can all be avoided if, if you use the resources that we give you for free. It costs you absolutely nothing to go online and, and get this information. And, and 
It was all paid for already. It was actually probably from your taxes and from your kids going to the university. So, uh, you know, it, it was your money. It's your information. Uh, we're only here to help you get a hold of it. So for goodness sake, please use all this free information. I cannot overemphasize that word. Free. See, now that, that should, mm -hmm. should make people want to spend the rest of the afternoon looking at things on Google. And you're welcome to email any one of us. And every county has their own extension office. So no matter where you live, you have your own extension office. And I always, I hear an awful lot of, but I always hate hearing what Bernie said earlier. Out of desperation, I went to the extension office. <laughs> we like, we like, we'd rather hear you come here first and avoid problems than come here last and have us have to give you the bad news about why your entire Bahia lawn died because your pH is 8.5 and Bahia grass doesn't really grow in 8.5 pH. And now it's you're out $3,000. And I still can't figure out why the sod company didn't know that or tell you that or test your soil. So check with us first. Don't if worst goes to worst, check with us last. We, we do a lot of um, uh, our best at post-mortem analysis of things that didn't work out well. Now, the sad part about it is we're kind of preaching to the choir here. The, exactly. The, the people that are watching the program are, are not the people that need the information. So mm -hmm. I, I guess what I'm really saying is, hey, everybody out there, go over and poke your neighbor and, and pass it on. <laughs> and, you know, you learned it someplace. <laughs> You're, you're the reservoir of talent that, that the state has to offer. Uh, make sure your neighbors get the talent instead of the guy that looks over the fence and says, well, you got a brown patch on your yard. That must be changed bugs. Uh, that, that's all too common there. The bad information is a lot easier to get than good information. And you are the guys with the good information. Pass it on. Thank you. We need to have a crazy neighbor's day where we can all share stories about advice neighbors have given us that was just really bad, awful, uh -huh. not correct. <laughs> yeah. I could, I could go on. I could go on about yeah, bad neighbor I, advice. I've, I've heard some, some winners and zingers also. Um, Bernie and I could probably have a special where we talk about crazy questions we've seen come into the office but we probably have to get former county director uh, Stacy Strickland in on that one also, because he's got some stories about some unusual people. And I think really soon we're going to have another day um, where we will have a link available. If you want to come on with us, if your computer or device has a camera and a microphone and you want to have your own little block like all of us do, we'll put you on. So, um, Am I going to be here next week? What am I doing next week? I don't. I actually don't Maybe know. I'll be here next week. I should be here. Okay, we'll do the uh, we'll do the join in thing next week. If Teresa is here next week, because Pete, everybody will have to email Teresa. I'll, I'll put her email on the screen. She'll send you the link, and then you'll pop up, and I'll let you on the screen with all of us to ask your questions live. And you could be famous like all of us are <laughs> with your own little Hollywood squares. Colby, do you remember Hollywood squares? No. I've okay. never heard that in my life. <laughs> Stupid question. <laughs> I can't Bernie, remember that. You never yeah. Hollywood squares, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That, this is, that's what this always kind of reminded me of. So you too can be live with us on here next week. I'll get with Teresa about that. And so everybody, everybody clean up the little lens on your camera, check your microphone, make sure you're all set. Um, if things get out of hand, keep in mind, I can kick you off very, very quickly. So, and then, you know, um, I believe it's the end of March. Let's see if I've even picked a tentative day for this. Um,
I think we're going to have to do it probably March 28th. Do you know what we're going to do, guys? Do you know what that is? If Lily's still on, she should know what that is. That's going to be right about the four-year anniversary of us doing this crazy thing here. The 28th is a Wednesday. What? Are you sure of March? Oh, no. No, I'm wrong. Yeah, March. March 28th. Because March 28th, it's as yeah. Close to April 1st as we can get. So March 28th, I think, is going to be our four-year anniversary. So everybody, please be sure to join us. We're going to have lots and lots of special guests on for that. And um, last year, Teresa set off explosives in my office that shot out little pieces of paper. <laughs> I think we finally got them all off the ceiling. I know I have them behind the furniture still. They'll always be here. So, so join us for that. That'll be a lot of fun. <gasps> Teresa one day wants to share some of her stories from the office, so I know that Teresa gets some of the really um, unique people. I try to phrase that correctly. Uh, we're getting real close to the end here. Um, Lily points out that we did the first one on April 1st, pretty appropriate for something like this. <laughs> uh, so we try to make the anniversary as close to April 1st as we can. And to wrap up today, we have a question from Bernie here. Cindy asks, my neighbor is moving and said I can have cuttings from his plumeria. It's about seven feet high because Cindy lives in um, Pinellas County. Leaves are starting to come out. What is the best way to take cuttings? Thanks. Well, the, the wonderful thing about plumeria is anything you cut off of it, if, if it's a foot long, will produce another plant mm -hmm. so uh, if if you cut uh in the middle of a, a branch you will start a plant but the plant that existed will double where you cut it so uh you get a single stem plant and and the donor plant when it gets cut produces two branches so like a hydra so so if you keep doing that if you have a, a, a plant you keep cutting uh cuttings off of eventually it has lots and lots and lots of branches um if if the plant is fairly good size and it's flowering already uh you'll get flowers in the first couple of years if, if it's a, a a younger plant and isn't flowering uh it, it's very confusing on those things because sometimes they flower in a year sometimes they flower five six seven eight years later but eventually they will flower and and you can just keep taking pieces uh, a, a piece about a foot long is is a real good starting point the problem here is those things are unbelievably tender and if they get frozen to the ground it probably takes them out completely so uh it, if you put them in a pot they don't mind being pot bound they, they will withstand being pot bound better probably than any plant that i know of so uh, uh, a three gallon pot can hold a, a 10 foot high plum area amazing how that works so uh yes yeah, that answered should... your question uh okay. you can take as many cuttings as you want the the donor plant every place it gets cut uh it, it tends to twin or triple uh all the cuttings should should go real well and all you gotta mm -hmm. do is stick them down in the pot it is the easiest plant going it's a great one for somebody that's as dumb as I am when you first come to Florida on how to do things, I love that plant. It it was my first success at, at propagating anything. So uh, I really enjoy them, and, and I hope that uh, you do real well. So cutting from, it said it's about seven feet tall. Yeah, it, it's probably flowering fine, and, and you're going to end up with a really good, good cutting off of it. And Cindy points out that next Thursday is Leap Day. So 
we'll have to make something of that. We'll have to think about that. Yeah, it is. Yeah. We we only I, I have that, that class <laughs> every four years. Oh my gosh, and we're coming up on our four year anniversary. Okay, guys, looks like it's oh my goodness, it is exactly eleven AM. So Let's go ahead and wrap this up for today. Thank you so much for joining us. We will be back again next Thursday for Leap Day. Uh, we'll have to plan out something special, try to get some guests. Um, uh, Alyssa with Mosquito Control was supposed to be with us today, but she wasn't able to make it. Um, I know that I'll try to find some guests for next week. So I know that Leanna uh, Colby has the flu. I just I just saw the email. Here I today we'd... will not be. I wonder if she's watching. I wonder if she even knows about this. We need to have her on sometime. Yeah. Talking about compost. <laughs> so, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining in. We'll see all of you hopefully back here next week. Like I said, if you would like to join us on the screen, You'll be able to do so. I'll make sure that Teresa has the link and she knows the emails are coming and we'll work it all out and we'll have a great time. And if you want to just kind of stack up all your spring related questions for next week, then we'll have plenty to talk about. Uh, we won't get bored. We usually don't get bored anyway. So mm. if nothing else, we'll just talk about coffee some more, I guess. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye.